Hey, I got shirts now, and I was advised to say all of this at the beginning of the video, so here it is. Bye. Many people who were interested in gaming back in the late 90s through 2010 or so knew about Bioware in some form or another. After receiving a fantastic amount of success with Baldur's Gate, Baldur's Gate 2, and Neverwinter Nights, Bioware dipped its toe into the realm of Star Wars, releasing the universally acclaimed Knights of the Old Republic in 2003. The game was lauded for its writing specifically, with rewards being heaped onto it over time for how well its story was told. I recall picking up the game for Xbox when I was about 12 years old or so and having fun with it, but I also remember a lot of the plot going over my head. I wasn't super familiar with the Star Wars universe until I was about 13 when Episode 3 came out, so a lot of the different background lore was overwhelming. I do remember being excited about the actual mechanics of the game, but a lot of the story is lost on me even today. As much as I would like to try to figure out if this game was as good as I remember, I don't remember much. So instead, I'd like to go into this evaluation with semi-fresh eyes and see if it holds up to the praise that it got even today. Oh, also, spoilers. Lots of spoilers. Spoilers for the game itself and chunks of the Star Wars franchise. If you care about those, go play all of the Star Wars games and watch all of the movies right now. I'll wait. I'm not gonna wait. Ooh. As always, I don't tend to critique the graphical quality of a game that's nearly old enough to vote, but, uh... I'm gonna mod this game to not look like... this. I obviously won't be adding anything that changes the original story of the game at all. If you want to know which mods I installed, they'll be in my description. At any rate, jumping into the game has you creating your character in an extremely D&D-esque fashion. This means that having 8 or 9 points in an attribute gives you a negative 1 modifier, 10 or 11 gets you a flat 0, and so on. In addition to this, you start with a base class which reflects more on a combat-oriented character, a stealthier one, or a jack-of-all-trades who focuses more on skills. As an avid fan of D&D, I already love this system, and I decided to roll with a relatively balanced but charismatic knight who has some bulkiness and dodge chance. My first instinct was to toss a large chunk of my stats into strength, but one of the things that I do recall is a lot of equipment having a bonus to strength. In addition to this, I get to sink some points into skills. With my int being set to 12 and my class being set to knight, I really only get to choose a handful of skills with the amount of points that I have. I decided to focus as much as I could on Persuasion, which is a max of 2, and then dump the rest into Awareness and Treat Injury. And then finally you get to pick out a feat, which mostly affects combat. I decided to go with 2 weapon fighting because who wouldn't? The character creation is fantastic, and I imagine it lends a ton of replayability to the game in and of itself, as it seems to allow you to focus on letting you figure out a build that you want to roleplay or that just suits your playstyle in general. Starting the game up brings you to a very familiar opening which I personally have never really enjoyed. I get that the scrolling text is very iconic, but for some reason I always have trouble reading it when it starts to really scroll further. Though it's not so much reading as it is like comprehending it for some reason. Either way, the story takes place about 4,000 years before the formation of the first galactic empire, the main antagonist force featured in the original trilogy of movies. In Knights of the Old Republic, the main antagonist appears to be Darth Malak, who has unleashed a seemingly unstoppable wave of Sith combatants upon the Jedi Order. This has backed the Order into a corner, with many of their knights falling or converting to the Sith Armada. Our character's story begins in the midst of this dire situation, above a planet known as Terrus. Alright, nerd shit aside, we got this guy who comes in and talks loudly at me. He's like, ah fuck, we gotta hurry dude, the officer in charge really needs help being protected. I repeat, we really need to hurry. I work the night shift, probably why you haven't seen me. We have to hurry. They said you were the top in your class, probably the best that they've ever seen. We really probably should hurry though. To move towards the footlocker, hold down the right mouse button and face the camera towards it. Then hold down the left mouse button as well to cause the character to run forward. <laughs> I'm sorry, fucking what? Yeah, this was definitely made at a time where developers went, uh, what's the most natural hand position you can think of? WSCZ, dude! I actually wind up dragging the camera around with my mouse like an MMO, which is definitely better than just using WASD to move around while keeping the camera stationary. It's not a deal breaker or anything, it's just different. But yeah, this whole beginning bit is definitely less of an immersive experience and more of a small voice in my mind going, you're playing a video game. It's not a huge deal, really. I just honestly found some of the more tutorial bits kind of funny in a way. Once the footlocker is selected, left click on it again to perform the default action. Alright, here's how this game works. 
you're usually going to be involved in a party of sorts, and you can swap around to the other members of your party to use the various skill sets to progress throughout the game. In addition to this, the combat looks incredibly similar to something like an older MMO, where you target your enemy, approach, and start using whatever skills or abilities you have at your disposal to take them down. This is an incredibly dated system that has almost no place in more modern video games. I imagine that the combat would throw off many newcomers to the game just with how archaic it looks and feels. Personally, I thought I would mind it a lot more than I do. It's probably the hundreds of hours that I've sunk into World of Warcraft and Dragon Age. Beyond this, the menus and general way that you use things tend to be taken care of through clicking on whatever it is that you want to use. This encompasses looting, healing, and generally accessing any of your menus. I do feel like this game would be a lot worse off without the pause function, so it's fortunate that it does exist so that I can think over what I want to do when I get fed up with watching my character whiff power attacks. As for the actual story on this ship, it's not super great yet, obviously, since it's all tutorial. You fight through these shiny boys, and then you get to a bit where a Jedi is fighting a dark Jedi, and they both biff it. Trask here is like, whoa, don't get near those guys, you'll just get in the way. They're way too powerful. Then later on, another dark Jedi comes rolling in like he's about to drop the hottest album of 3956 BBY, and old Trask is like, alright, stand back, son, I'm about to have the most anticlimactic death since Ben Kenobi. So we're nearing the end of our tutorial. I've got a flurry attack now. This guy named Karth keeps popping up to let me know what my battle royale status is. Things are pretty normal. Then you get to mess around with hacking and repairing, which is pretty straightforward. Basically, you need to have some computer spikes and or repair kits to slice computers or fix broken things. If your skills are high enough in the computer use or repair category, it takes less of these tools to get done what you're trying to get done. Hey Dave. Yeah? Did you try the coffee this morning? Yeah, it was pretty weak. Right? I've been telling everyone I can about this, and they just won't do anything. At any rate, Bastila made it off the ship. Karth and I follow suit, and I wake up to him filling me in on what's going on. We're now on the planet of Terrace, which is under complete Sith control. Our mission is to locate Bastila and do our best to break through the Sith blockade and hightail it out of this place. Apparently, she's so important because of her rare force ability to inspire her allies to fight to their fullest, and her enemies to feel a sense of powerlessness during key battles. This ability is known as Battle Meditation, and it requires a tremendous amount of focus and energy to pull off, which explains why she was unable to use it during the sudden ambush. Karth also says that our best bet is to look for her in the Undercity, as word of a few escape pods landing there has made its way to his ears. Terrace itself used to be a sprawling, wonderful metropolis of a planet, but has now fallen into disarray, with it getting worse and worse with dangerous and criminal elements the further down you go. And the very bottom is filled with monsters. Cool. What I will say about how the dialogue is handled is that it's very... jumbled. I'm unsure if it's just Karth's voice actor or the direction that he was given, but a lot of his sentences feel like he's completely unsure of what he's saying or at a weirder intonation than you would expect given the sentence. It's obvious that Malik's a ruthless tyrant who'll crush anyone who stands in his way, just like Revan was. Experience- Knowing that this voice actor is the same as Caden in Mass Effect, I'm guessing that it was probably on Bioware's end. Anyways, I finally get to just start roaming around and exploring shit. I talk to different humans and aliens, terrorize people by busting into their apartments and stealing whatever the hell's in their rooms, and learn a little more about Terrace. This merchant lady tells me about how the quarantine is really fucking with business, which has so much more relevance in today's world. The big thing that I noticed about the dialogue is that it's very cyclical. Basically, you ask her about the crashed escape pods, and then she tells you about them and then mentions that they might have gotten hit by swoop gangs. Then you ask her what those are, and she tells you that they're gangs that uh, swoop. They just like swoop in and grab shit. And a gang though, using swoop bikes. Brilliant. Then at the end, she mentions that some dude named Davik is having issues with everything. You ask her about Davik, and she explains that he's a big old crime lord. You ask if he works with the Sith, and she's like, nah, he stays out of the way. Unlike those goddamn swoop gangs. And then you get the option to ask what that is again. Then you ask for general information about Terrace, and she tells you stuff that you mostly know already and ends with, but stay out of the lower city because those motherfucking swoop gangs are there. Even Davik is having trouble. And the whole conversation kind of repeats itself if you let it. I guess it's an alright way to get all the info while going in pretty much any order that you want. 
but the issue is that when you do get all of the info, the game repeats its points quite a few times. But honestly, this wouldn't even be as big of an issue if it weren't for those accursed swoop games. Exploring Terrace a little more leads me to the cantina, which has a jazzy tune playing to it. This was not what I signed up for when I read the word cantina. The main draw here at first is the game of Pazak, which is basically head-to-head -head blackjack with a small twist. The game itself is just luck, and the twist of allowing you to play cards which add to or subtract from your score can be bullshit. And I say that as someone who repeatedly swept the supposed Pazak champion of Terrace. It's a fun mini game though, honestly, and I think that's what counts here. I mean, come on, who doesn't like Blackjack? In addition to Blackjack 2, there's this off-duty Sith officer who acts all surprised that you would even take the time to talk to her. I try to woo her with my persuasion and she goes from, oh, you're a nice guy, to, all right, fuck off. Well, all right then, didn't think that messing up a persuasion check that's literally just me empathizing with her would turn into me being a complete dick. What's even funnier is the fact that all I have to do to succeed is try again when I talk to her through her speech cycle. This nets me with the knowledge that there's going to be some kind of Sith after party when they're done, uh, I don't know, oppressing people for the day. I'm apparently now invited to this party, which actually sounds pretty amusing. This was a pretty interesting interaction, which makes some of the Sith officers seem more human. Now, don't get me wrong, she also goes on about being on a shitty backwater planet and how the people should be grateful for them being here. So it's not like I'm sitting here thinking, huh, maybe they're actually good guys. But it's nice to see them in a more approachable light. The last notable part of the cantina is the fighting arena. First you watch as two dudes duke it out and then you get your own shot. Every time you win, you get 10% of the bets unless you're able to persuade Jabba Jr. to part with more. The first two rounds are no issue. The third is tougher. And then motherfucking Joffrey, Grandmaster of the Blades, comes strolling in and just destroys me. So yeah, I'm gonna hold off on that. Let's go crash a Sith party. Careful, Sana. That wine's got quite the kick. A couple more bottles and we'll all be passed out on the floor. Who cares? We're not on duty tomorrow. Let's live a little. This game is honest to God unintentional comedy. I mean, maybe them suddenly showing up on the ground was intentional, but I like to think that they just didn't want to animate a scene where they pass out on the ground while partying. Still, hilarious. Anyways, I get a set of Sith armor out of this, which comes in handy with fooling the local population. I like this a lot, as most people will react to you completely differently now, including this guy who cowers before me as a Sith soldier and then cowers before me as a regular dude because he thinks I'm there to kill him for a bounty that Davik placed on his head. I give him 200 Walmart money to help him out, which nets me some good boy points and experience. The main importance to picking up the Sith armor is bypassing the guard who stands at the entrance to the lower city. Now I can slip in and hopefully get to where Bastila is. It's at the start of the lower city where you get to witness two swoop gangs fight each other before you mop up the victors. From here, you make it to another cantina with the exact same layout, right down to another hut lying about in a room. First, you encounter this absolute badass of a bounty hunter, Callow Nord, who annihilates a group of thugs trying to start shit with him. Instead of talking, he just counts. When he hits three, they all die. Well, as it turns out, Callow does the same thing to me too, even though I approach him as a friend. The guy is no joke. Beyond this, you learn that Davik supposedly has a ship quick enough to bust through the Sith blockade, but the auto-targeting lasers that their armada is equipped with would still take out the ship. This tells me that I probably need to steal or earn that ship from Davik while also shutting down the laser defenses. The more important bit here is meeting Mission and her Wookiee friend, Zalbar. Mission's got a weird name, but she's a fun character. She seems to be younger, but knows the lower city in and out, as she seems to be a roguish type who gets into a lot of trouble. Zalbar is her muscle, who follows her around and seems primarily interested in eating food. She gives you some background knowledge about how the two gangs got to being at each other's throats before bouncing off to another cantina ran by another gang. Then you get to witness the inspiration behind the dance-off and connect Star Wars by helping out this lady who's trying to get a job. But if I've learned anything about this game, it's that when someone is proclaimed as dangerous, they usually very much are. I like that a lot because my initial instinct as someone who's playing a game is to go, yeah, I can take them on, no problem. In this game, if I start some shit with a badass, you can bet your ass I'm gonna get destroyed if I'm not properly leveled up. 
It's a very old school style of playing and I enjoy it a lot. So far, I'm definitely enjoying the game, but the gameplay has aged horribly, very horribly. While I wanna to get to the next bit to progress the storyline, I find myself a little aggravated with slowly walking to the next area, occasionally getting into a fight, and then slowly continuing on. And it sucks because whenever I do get to the next part of the story or a random encounter, I'm pretty enthralled with whoever I wind up meeting and talking to. I could definitely see myself emphatically loving the game if it were remastered with a fresh combat and movement system and a less clunky UI. All right, so now I'm hit with an absolute barrage of information in the form of the next stage of this quest. First, we meet this really trusting dude who's the head of a faction down here who's had a lot of troubles with the gang who's been terrorizing the lower and under city. He tells me that the pods that crashed here were picked clean by the gang, and that Bastila has been taken hostage as a slave. Since she's no ordinary slave, she's being posted as the prize for whoever wins the next big swoop bike race. So now I have to enter this race and win on behalf of this guy's faction so that the Volkar gang loses enough reputation to hopefully ward them off from raiding these guys for a while longer. But their accelerator prototype was stolen by the Volkars, and without it, we're probably going to lose the race. So I have to find Mission again and get her to guide me to the back entrance of the base, steal the prototype, and win the race. But to even get to the Undercity, I have to get past the Sith Guard, who apparently doesn't care about uniforms and does care about archaic paper which has been stamped with a general, you may pass into this part of the city. Fortunately, this guy happens to have gotten some of the papers and is willing to trade them for my uniform. This is like an old point-and-click King's Quest game. Old school quest structure aside, I'm scratching my head trying to figure out why the security system isn't completely reversed. Like, why would the Sith care about me trying to get into the worst part of the city? Why wouldn't they be guarding the upper part more instead? I don't know, maybe I'm missing something. In addition to this, Karth over here loves injecting little quips of information into the conversations you're having, but the quest giver never really acknowledges anything he says. It's like, yeah, they took this Republic officer hostage. And Karth goes, oh good, they don't know that she's more than just an officer. I guess he's supposed to be whispering? I don't know, shit's weird. Well, the Undercity is about as shitty as the game made it out to be. It looks like an unfinished beta map. The monsters mentioned prior are known as Rack Ghouls. These are basically zombie-type creatures which infect others by biting them, eventually turning them into other Rack Ghouls. They also hit like a truck. Anyways, I find Mission, who's in a bit of trouble. Her Wookiee friend from before got captured by slave traders who took the sewers, and Mission promises to help me infiltrate the Volcar base in exchange for busting him out. She also joins my party, which is definitely needed at this stage. Her usefulness extends past just being a pretty good shot, as she can get through doors and disarm mines pretty handily, almost completely outdoing Karth. Fortunately, we drudge our way through the sewers pretty easily and pick up Zalbar as another party member, who swears a life debt to me, making him loyal to me forever. So I toss Karth out and we have ourselves a real party now. From here, it's a bit more of the same with the added bonus of a rancor in its natural habitat, a pit. Getting by him is easy if you know how to read. Otherwise, it might take a bit to learn how to read the data pad that tells you to stuff the corpse pile with a grenade and some yum yum sauce. After this is the Volcar base, followed by the garage. Thank God I have allies who are much more powerful than I am, because I've severely underestimated the D&D chance to hit while dual wielding rules. Fortunately, I started to sink some feats into bettering it, but yeah. My character is not the most powerful here and probably won't be until mid-game. The gameplay is pretty harrowing at this point, as everything needs to be clicked a few times to get working, and the environment is some of the ugliest I've seen in a very long time. Also, alt-tabbing has turned a couple of us here into pseudo-silver surfers. So I was wondering when I would encounter the dark side choice of this mission, or if there was one at all. Turns out that there's a higher-up dude for the Volkars here who offers me 500 credits and the girl if I turn on the leader of the Hidden Becks and kill him instead. I'm sitting here thinking, geez, that sounds a lot easier than winning a race, but then he's like, yeah, but you also gotta win the race. We'll basically just give you the good bike to win with. I decide to turn this guy's armor shiny also and then give him the old slash and dash. All right, blah, 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 run through the base slowly, blah, blah, now we're racing. The racing isn't, um, it's not very impressive. I mean, not compared to how this whole race thing was built up in my mind. But you know something? I actually kinda had fun. The mechanics are very simple, but I liked it. Anyways, the leader of the Volkars comes out and throws a bitch fit about me cheating, and then says that he's taking Bastila back as a prize. 
Then Bastila breaks out of the cage because, I don't know, she remembered she's a Jedi? Maybe she was a little sleepy before. I don't, I don't understand that. It's just very convenient is all. Whatever. We kill the guy and then I get the pleasure of talking to my absolute least favorite character in the game so far. Bastila is an outright pompous prick of a Jedi. I know she's written to be insufferable and I'm sure she'll go through some character arc that makes her more tolerable, but Christ, she's an ass. Oh, nice try rescuing me, but I'm afraid I've rescued myself with a little known thing called the Force. Maybe you've heard of it? At least Karth doesn't put up with her shit at all, shooting his power ranking up to a more respectable place. Alright, we gotta get off Terrace before I go nuts, man. And right as I leave the apartment, someone approaches me with an offer to meet up with Davik's right-hand man to figure out how to do just that. Candorus here hasn't been getting paid what he's owed, so he's a little miffed with Davik. He wants me to steal the codes to shut down the Sith lasers and then he'll provide the ride out. To bust into the Sith base, I need to purchase a specialized droid to help me out. Fortunately, one of the big upsides to having Bastila is her speed increase ability, which makes all this running back and forth go twice as fast. Before we take on the Sith base, I do a little more arena stuff, which winds up with me being the champion. You can seek out one of the old champions from back when the arena allowed death matches and fight him too, with the added bonus of him being a bounty target. But I suck, so let's go do the Sith shit instead. Yes? Yeah? Running through the base is basically more of the same stuff as before, so I'll cut right to the good stuff. Awaiting at the end of this base is a Sith governor. He seems like he's going to be a cakewalk at first, but then he starts using the force to stun my party and heal himself. The guy's pretty tough, and this is really the fight that made me realize how much I need to switch to other members in my party to make sure that they're using the correct skills to take him down. Even this far in, which I know isn't terribly far, I'm still learning by experimentation. I think it's a great way to approach the otherwise simple on the surface gameplay, and it's probably the most fun I've had in one of these battles. After this, I make it over to Candorus and we move onward to Davik's base, with me pretending to be a potential recruit. Well, that plan lasts all of five minutes as I immediately figure out where the codes for the ship are, and we bust out of this place. On our way out, the Dark Lord Malak has decided to destroy the planet of Terrus in an effort to kill Bastila. This means that Davik is also trying to escape with the badass from before, Kalo Nord. Well, Kalo isn't as much of a badass at this ascended level, and we have no issue taking him out. This results in an escape sequence where I shoot ships down with a turret. It's... stale. I'm sure this was an amazingly cool feature back in 2003, but it's extremely lackluster now and feels even more out of place than the swoop bike race. But we made it! Finally, off the tutorial planet and onward to Dantooine. Alright, how many pages of script do we got here? Six? Cool. And how many more planets? Ah, oh, fuck. Alright, this video might be a little long, but you knew that. So my guy's been seeing all of these visions, memories of Bastila fighting the Dark Lord Revan and supposedly defeating him. He also witnesses Revan and Malak approaching something known as the Starforge in the ancient ruins of this planet, which is a vision that he shares with Bastila. In addition to this, I apparently have a strong presence of the Force dwelling within me. This is very unusual, and my fate is to be left with the Jedi Council on Dantooine. May the Force be with you. And also with you. So I start my training. I spar, learn how to use the Force, seek knowledge from old scriptures, you know, Jedi shit. It's explained how Revan and Malak were very eager Jedi students, whose insatiable lust for knowledge and power led them to the dark side. Something happened when they left to eradicate a Mandalorian threat to the Jedi Order, and it corrupted them to a point where they gave themselves to the dark side. Now with my training nearing completion, my task is to join Bastila in figuring out what Revan and Malak found at the runes here on Dantooine. But first, I gotta pass a pop quiz. I fail it five times before I force my way through it, but then we get to the good stuff, lightsaber flavors. You got your cool mint flavor, which begets the way of the Guardian. They do melee stuff. Then you got your Cheeto flavor, which represents the Sentinel. They're all about cool skills. And finally, you got the Shamrock Shake flavor. No one wants that. I want purple. Oh well, you already know we're going blue. So I grab my saber, and now the last part of my test is to go to a nearby grove-type thing and expel the dark force energy residing within it. Before I head out, I learn a little more about what happened with Revan and Malak. 
Revan was supposedly a genius military tactician who led the Republic fleet to victory after victory when the Mandalorians moved in on the weakened order following a war with a rogue Sith Lord. Eventually, Revan more or less won the war for the Jedi and was hailed as a hero. Then he disappeared with the entire fleet, and rumors followed about sightings of him on various planets alongside Malak. When he did return, he commanded an even greater armada before as a Sith Lord. Many of the ships were completely alien to the Jedi Order, and soon he began conquering everything in sight, quelled only by Bastila's strike team. When he fell, the less strategy-inclined Malak took over, rolling over the Republic with sheer numbers instead of tactical brilliance. My main takeaway here is that Sith Lords always have super evil-sounding names before they become Sith Lords. For as much training as I've endured and wisdom that I've absorbed, it took me 20 minutes to figure out that I needed to talk to a droid to leave this place. I'm not sure what that says about me, but it can't be good. So Dantooine is a grassy, kind of farmland-type planet with several family mansion-type things surrounding the area. I could rush straight to the objective and take care of it, but there are a few side quests that show up before it. Stuff like helping a woman find her droid, which seems to have opened the front door and walked away, despite her claims that it was kidnapped. Then there's a few Mandalorian survivors who have been terrorizing random families and demanding money from them. And finally, there's a murder mystery involving two men who claim that the other killed the victim. I hash out that one first, determining that both men plotted to kill the victim separately. The first one because his wife was cheating on him with the victim, and the second one because he suspected the victim was fucking him over in a business deal. It's interesting because I really thought that I'd have no interest in side quests in this game, especially when a lot of them are presented as something like, ah, these guys are killing us, help! But a lot of them have a lot more complexity to them than they initially present on the surface, and many of them have a light or dark side choice. They're pretty well done and they make me actually enjoy the delay from the main quest. The last trial that I face involves taking down this Jedi who turned to the dark side recently. She's just sitting over near these trees, looking menacingly onward towards, uh... I don't know, plants and animals. After getting her low enough, she goes on about how she was such a fool to trust in the dark side's power and how I should kill her. I eventually convince her that she should go talk to the council and ask for forgiveness. The council's like, yeah, sure, whatever, and I become a Padawan. The thing that irks me about the council is how little that they seem to do. Yeah, I'm sure that they all have their own jobs, but they preach about how a Jedi truly discovers themselves and their role in the universe by going out into the world and solving issues for others, basically. Like, oh, a Jedi isn't a true Jedi unless they go do things. And then they just sit here and kind of hang out around the premises. I mean, I'm sure at least one or two of them are necessary to hang out and answer questions and guide trainees, but all of them? I don't know. This passive behavior even affects the next main quest, where they're like, yeah, so uh, we sent a Jedi to go figure out what's up with those runes that Revan and Malak entered in your dream, and he never came back. Maybe we shouldn't have sent him. Anyways, you want to go to those runes? Like, dude, why don't you go to those runes that a Sith Lord investigated? What? Then a guy comes in from one of the two family mansions and goes, The other family kidnapped my son. And the council goes, So, uh, you want to go do that too? My guy, what the hell is everyone else doing in this place? Yeah, yeah, I know it's a video game and I know it's just a way of presenting the quest, but man... The game does a pretty okay job at explaining some of the blatant contradictions, like how this prodigy of a Jedi got ambushed and wasn't able to use her battle meditation because of it. Then all of the problems on Dantooine seem to be heaped onto the player. I guess a lot of it is just my feelings on how slow the Jedi Order moves in general. These idiots watched as all of these planets around their planets were taken over by the Mandalorians, and went, yeah, but those aren't our planets, we ain't gotta do shit. And then they were surprised when the Mandalorians amassed all of their forces and started smoking them. I know they were just coming off of a war, but I almost agree with Revan's methodology of taking the fight back to them. I mean, yeah, the guy turned to the dark side, but before that he got the job done. I just find it ludicrous that even when the Mandalorians started their assault, the council was still like, uh, eh, maybe we should just play this defensively. You fucking ding-dongs. The Jedi Order are basically bronze-level StarCraft players. The whole situation with the two families is pretty straightforward. First one kidnapped the other one's son because they thought the other one kidnapped their son. Kidnapped son doesn't want to leave without the kidnapper's daughter because he loves her. Comedy ensues. There you are, Shen. Father. Mr. Matale. Rahesha. Father. Mr. Sandril. Yurik. Alan. But the real interesting part is the main quest. 
Apparently, the Star Forge which Revan and Malak found is some kind of ancient device capable of tremendous power. It's speculated that this forge was what created the alien ships which Revan flew in on. The robot guardian here tells us that the forge was crafted on Dantooine by slaves which were commanded by a race known as the Builders. After the forge was finished, all of the slaves were executed, and this robot guardian silently watched over the creation grounds, fueled by the Star Forge's power. This thing and the race which built all of this is apparently well over 20,000 years old, even older than the Republic. To get to the area where the forge supposedly is, I have to figure out some puzzles and answer some questions correctly. They're pretty easy, but all of this is definitely intriguing. When I get to the center of this Tootsie Pop, it's not the Star Forge which awaits me, but a map to its possible location. The map highlights several planets which Revan and Malik were spotted on at one point, which means that we've got a treasure trail to follow. At this stage, Bastila shows a little more interest in you, which is exactly the direction I imagined her character would take. She's a little less cold, a little more straightforward, and wants to know exactly what it means to have her fate bound to yours. Her score goes up a few points. Anyways, now I get to determine which order I want to hit these planets in and shape my game. All I really know is that I want to hit the Sith world of Korriban last. To start, I'm at an impasse with Tatooine and Kashyyyk, but ultimately I think that Tatooine would be the best bet because I recognize it from other Star Wars media. So I take off and witness a cutscene showing Malak talking to his top guy, and Kalo Nord who apparently somehow made it off of Terrace after being buried in rubble during a Sith attack. Yeah, okay. He's evidently going to be hunting us for a bit longer. When I arrive on Tatooine, I communicate with my whole crew and learn a bit more about them. Bastila talks about dark side stuff, Catgirl talks about that too, Big Z talks about someone eating our food supply, Karth talks about not trusting me at all, which severely hurts his rankings, Candorus talks about living for the thrill of battle as all Mandalorians do, and this robot goes beep boop. I couldn't find Big Blue, but I could find this stowaway who's been eating our food. Her language is completely fucked, and it takes a bit to understand exactly what she's saying but it appears that she's a stowaway who feels safe on this ship and has escaped from Mandalorian custody, potentially on Dantooine. We'll take care of that later, let's get out to this desert. I'm greeted by a worker from Space Walmart who tries to shake me down for 100 credits. I persuade my way out of that after a few botched attempts and then ask about what all is around here. Apparently, Tatooine is regarded as a shithole. Zerka Corporation set up shop here after they were tricked by a rival company into thinking that it was going to be a profitable business endeavor, and have been struggling ever since. The most profitable things to do here now are hunt exotic creatures and turn in their trophies, participate in pod race, uh, swoop bike racing, and general bounty hunting. Zerka Corporation has completely locked down the entire place, swamping it with layers of bureaucracy and corporate greed. You need to have a hunting license to leave the city which they control and sell. They're in the middle of mining ore that deteriorates rapidly and is all but useless, and yet they still try to sell it. They make all of their workers sign waivers, which ensures that they have no liability for loss of life on the job. They're just complete dickheads in every sense of the word. Right now, so many people have hunter licenses that they're not giving them out anymore. Except almost in the same breath, this corporate drone tells me that she'll give me one if I sign a contract to eliminate a particular tribe of sand people outside of the city walls. Hey. That is racist. I could zip relatively quickly to the main objective at this stage, but as always, the side quests are enticing. These include trying to infiltrate and negotiate peace with the Sand People, which I imagine might lead me to the main quest as well. Then I can help out this hunter whose wife trapped him with his own droids and left him to die. And then finally, I get to ward off waves of Sand People who are attacking Zerka miners. A lot of these are short and sweet, but negotiating peace seems like the big one. First off, no one can really communicate with the Sand People. It's rumored, however, that there's a droid that's being sold at a shop here which can. Meet HK-47, easily the most evil character which is able to join my party so far. He's a quick-witted combat droid who doesn't quite remember everything about himself. The shop owner wants 5,000 credits for him, but can be talked down to 3,000 if you negotiate. He'll knock off another 500 if you threaten him, but that would be mean and dark, oh god! Well, I don't have that kind of money, so I make it by swoop racing and come back. HK might be one of my favorite party members solely because he's basically Bender, but with less drinking. He lies when he needs to, he calls me master sarcastically at times, the first thing he offers to do for me after I buy him is to kill someone for me, and he gets pissed off when I dig around at his circuitry to try to repair him and fail at it. 
He's a good guy. Well, I mean, not literally, but you know, he's cool. Then there's Mission. So I've covered all the basics with her background, but throughout my adventures, I've asked her about her family. Her main support system was her older brother, Griff, who helped to keep them as safe as he could when their parents died. The more that she talks about him, though, the more it sounds like he's a total scumbag. Hefting her into a crate to smuggle her away, ripping people off and get-rich-quick schemes, stealing from whoever he could, and eventually abandoning her on Terrace. Mission puts no blame on her brother and instead claims that some busty skank lured him away and told him to keep her away from them. Well, we eventually met said skank on Dantooine, and she appears to be very… nice, almost motherly towards Mission. Of course, it could just be a ruse, but she's a very good actress if this is the case. She claims that Griff was the one that told her to not buy Mission a ticket off the planet, explaining that he felt that Mission was holding them back. Eventually, Lena here left him on Tatooine while he tried to get rich quick some other way, explaining how badly she fell for Mission. Well, the Zerka drone from before informs me that Griff was signed up with their mining outfit before being carted off by the Sand People as their prisoner. The most peculiar thing that happens with Mission is that she doesn't stay naive to how her brother may be. Given the overwhelming evidence and opinions from other people that we've talked to about him, she's went from, he would never do all of that, to calling him a slimeball also. Of course, she still wants to help him, so I figure that we should get to that along with the whole Sand People infiltration thing. We also know that the star map is around one of these caves out here from a dream that Bastel and I shared, and it's also possibly been looted by the Sand People. As much as it seemed like there was a lot of haphazardly placed quests on Tatooine, I have to admit that I like how most of it is tied together in a way. So us sneaking into the Sand People area of the map isn't really too hard. We throw on some disguises and get recognized as outsiders when we make it in. But some hasty translations from HK-47 help out in a pinch. Shall I blast him now, master? The chieftain thinks that we're messing with them and asks for us to bring them some water vaporizers to prove ourselves. To which I oblige by hoofing it all the way back to the start of the map, realize that I could have went straight back to the ship, and then running all the way back. He's astonished that we came back and promises to reduce the attacks. Then he gives me his tribal stick thing that Zerka wanted as proof that I killed him, points me in the direction of the star map, and then tells me that I can take Griff with me since he's completely useless as a hostage. Like I said, I love when everything ties together. It just feels like all of that effort is that much more rewarding. Well, Griff is hands down easily the biggest piece of shit in the game now, instantly and completely blowing past Bastila at the beginning of the game. He's like, oh, I'm sure glad my sister's alive. Say, you got any credits? You motherfucker. Remind me to play through this game again on the dark side. At least Mission realizes how shitty her brother has been after all this time. All right, so now we've got to get this star map and heck on out of this desert wasteland. This requires me to take down a gigantic dragon, which in turn requires me to lead it out into some mines, which in turn requires me to lure some bantha over, which in turn requires me to use some fodder to do so. I already bought the fodder at the beginning of the area because it was one credit and there was only one in stock. Kinda seemed important. Well, as much as you might expect a fight with a weaker dragon, the mines actually do the entire job. I get a pearl, which is fantastic for upgrading my lightsaber, a few other nice equipment pickups, and of course the star map at the end of the cave. As I'm on my way out, here comes Kalonord again, who proves once more that he isn't the badass he seemed to be at first. Hopefully he's really dead this time. It's worth noting that there was a part earlier where I questioned Bastila about her background as a Jedi. She admits that she didn't actually kill Revan, but that interestingly enough, Malik turned his starship's guns on Revan's ship, nearly killing her and killing Revan instead. I find this interesting mostly because of how much Revan has been talked up at this point. Everything about him was said to be brilliant, and it makes me wonder if he's truly dead or not. All right, let's get off this rock. Yeah, you remember that turret section? It happens more than once. In fact, I head over to the trading outpost on Yevon to grab some gear and have to shoot down more ships. And then I have to do the exact same thing on the way back to Dantooine. It really sucks and it just feels like one of those things that got ramrodded into the game because it's a Star Wars thing. It's a very poor decision that's aged worse than the combat. What's also gotten pretty annoying is Bastila harping on about the dark side and how easy it is to fall prey to it. I swear we've had three separate conversations about what the dark side is and how anyone could be swayed by its siren call and about how we need to be better than that and blah blah blah. But all of this is made up for with the glorious purple lightsaber crystal that I found on Tatooine. My game is complete. 
Also, I drop off that stowaway, and I don't get attacked on my way to Kashik, which is nice. Kashik is a Wookiee homeworld, as I'm gently reminded by Mish when she tells me that Large Z has some unfinished business here. So I grab him and he relays to me that his brother was the one who let slavers set up camp here. He was so angry that he used his claws to strike his brother, which is taboo among the Wookiees, as claws are considered tools, not weapons. So he was exiled, his father believing his brother over himself. The Zerka Corporation drones are generally awful as always and have no issues with the enslavement of the Wookiees here. Meanwhile, Mission has forgotten what Zalbar looks like, as she lets me know that he would love to see the trees here. Weird. I think the worst thing about this place might be the, um, the ambient sounds. Like, there's this very light xylophone-type music, and then there's just this crazy loud droning of, like, insects and animal chirping and whatnot, and it's just very annoying. And it gets worse later with these little monkey things that run around. <laughs> then there's also the dialogue when I reach the Wookiee base of operations. I mean, yeah, they're Wookiees. They're not gonna speak Universal Basic, but it also makes the cutscene exchanges with my voiceless character kind of, um... <laughs> then again, if my character was fully voiced, he'd be doing the exact same thing back and that would be absolutely hilarious. At any rate, this is Zalbar's brother. He is unapologetically one of the biggest assholes in the game. He just outright tells you, yeah, so I uh, sold some of our people into slavery for weapons, got my brother kicked out of the village by spreading my story of him attacking me with his claws, then watched as the village chief, our dad, went and tried to fight the slavers. That guy probably got killed. Anyways, I'm the chieftain now and I'm still trading our people away to Zerka while pretending like we're putting up a good fight against them. He's just one of those obnoxiously evil characters, though not to a point where he just wants everyone to die or anything like that. It's all just personal gain for him. Anyways, he wants to keep Zalbar here for a while and sends me off to kill a Wookiee who's supposedly gone insane and is hiding in the Shadowlands. I doubt that the guy is actually insane and I'm hoping that I can recruit him to come back and destroy these guys. As easy as it is to actually write a selfish character who makes everyone else miserable, it's a super effective way to make the player want to bring them down. This brings us to our next companion, Jolie Bindo. Easily the most fun name to say in the game. Jolie is a crotchety old man of a Jedi living out here on Kashyyyk for the past decade or two. He's also voiced by Kevin Michael Richardson who's done lots and lots of voice acting for a multitude of games and other media. He's a good character who doesn't seem to want to talk much about himself, but he seems pretty disgruntled with Zerka's existence on the planet. He also notably doesn't care too much about discussing the whole light side, dark side nuance to the Force. I like that. I'm kind of tired of hearing about it myself, honestly and have started giving Bastila shit for it when she brings it up, which has actually made her a little more endearing towards me. Anyways, my task is to remove a camp of Zerka employees who have entrenched themselves near Jolie's house. Their commander doesn't care about moving at all and only wants to poach the creatures around the camp. The soldiers under his control, on the other hand, are pretty miserable. Fortunately, they can be persuaded to give me the codes to these little devices which keep all of the larger beasts at bay. Of course, they all have the exact same dialogue trees to get the codes from them, but you only need to shut down two of the devices before this big load comes storming through, effectively vacating them from the area, and allowing you to proceed further down into the Shadowlands. Kashyyyk is interesting in that it seems a lot more linear in terms of its quest progression. Where Tatooine and Dantooine had you stumbling upon a side quest every here or there, Kashyyyk seemed to be all picked up in the Shadowlands area of the map for the most part. These involve a droid with records of a Zerka boy up top killing off people who owed him money, a beast summoned by a ritual who killed a Jedi at one point, and a pack of Mandalorians who have apparently been attacking Wookiees who put their weapons away. That last one actually conflicts pretty harshly with Candorus's version of Mandalorian culture. He seemed to be pretty adamant about how Mandalorians are an honor-bound, fight-seeking people who live for battle. Well, apparently they have no idea why they're doing it either. The data pad on one of the corpses shows that they were commanded to do this in order to learn how to use Jedi weaponry by someone and they seem to be pretty bored with it at this point. The beast which killed the Jedi also strikes me as particularly interesting, as I was warned about these type of beasts on Dantooine. Supposedly, they're created when the dark side of the Force is in full effect, and are known to be very dangerous to Jedis in particular. The Council sent three Jedis off to exterminate these beasts after the last war with the Sith Lord Exar Kun, and apparently the one that got eaten here had gotten into a heated argument with the other two over the fact that they openly loved each other. 
he stormed off to this planet instead and got himself ate, but not before seemingly giving in to that prideful emotion that the dark side so often exudes. But more to the main bulk of this planet's questing. So the star map here is protected by some kind of AI which has been directed to give the coordinates only to an individual who it deems to match the parameters set by its creator. After quizzing it a little more, it's a fairly good guess that this creator was likely Revan himself. He identifies me as someone who can access his functions, but only if I pass a test. In order to test me, a series of questions is asked with only one correct answer each time. These questions involve a prison scenario where I can send Zalbar to prison for five years and go free if he doesn't accuse me also. Another scenario where I can let my city be attacked in five days to exploit an enemy's weakness in 10 days and a scenario where my nation is stagnating, and what I would do to keep my civilians from questioning my leadership. After failing the first question, it becomes very obvious that I should be answering these in a way that a Sith would. I pass the rest of the questions and get granted access to the star map. Now I know that this is probably going to be the big twist of the game, but I've been thinking this since I saw the cutscene where Bastila unmasks Revan. I'm guessing that I'm Revan. If that's correct, it's probably easy enough to say that I just looked it up but there's a lot of evidence pointing towards this theory so far. There's my character's very existence as this ultra-savvy soldier who suddenly sprung up and now has a very potent access to the Force. There's this big O-face that Bastila makes during the cutscene where Revan is unmasked. And now there's this AI who's been clearly programmed by Revan to identify one particular person. With as cunning and ruthless as Revan has been made out to be, I imagine the chances of him letting some random person access the star map is probably a solid 0%. It's all speculation at this point, but it's what I'm thinking right now. All right, let's finish up this planet. First off, I found Huge Z's father roaming around here, and we beat each other's asses. After this, we give him the blade that was found in the beast which slew the Jedi earlier, as it was some kind of legendary blade that their greatest warrior used forever ago. He goes back to confront his son, and I follow suit. When we arrive, Zalbar is basically like, yeah, so I know that my brother kind of enslaved my people and betrayed the shit out of both me and my father, but he's been making some crazy compelling arguments while you were gone. What? No, he hasn't. I don't need to be here to know how simple his arguments are. I think this was a really lazy way to shoehorn in a dark side response, and it really echoes my sentiment about this entire planet, honestly. I like the revenge story with Zalbar and his family. I like the portrayal of Zerka being the scum of the galaxy. What I don't like is how simple Zalbar's brother's reasoning has been. I don't like the hazy forest at the bottom of this planet, especially when you consider that Terrace had something like a rancor at the bottom of it and nothing even remotely rivaled that here, despite the Shadowlands being made out to be this really dangerous area. And like I mentioned before, I hated these stupid monkeys that constantly make the exact same sound over and over again during every little part of the Shadowlands exploration. Sure. I mean, holy shit, did no one mention this while playtesting? At any rate, I take Freyr's side, obviously, and then ask them to talk out their differences. Zalbar's brother puffs out his chest like a gorilla and goes, No, we fight now. All right, man. Well, whatever, the end result works out for me as the Wookiees begin killing off the remaining Zerka forces here. In between planet changes is another Malak cutscene in which he's disappointed in Kalo Nord's failure. It's like, um, you know in DK64 where K. Rule gets pissed every time he watches one of his bosses die to the Kongs? No? All right, sorry. Anyways, he then brings in the next boss, Darth Brandon, without the R. You can tell that he means business because he destroys one of the ship's consoles along with one of the troopers here. I guess both of those were totally expendable because Malik does not give a shit. I head back to Tatooine to see if another crate dragon spawned. I kinda doubt it, but I want another pearl for my other lightsaber. Well, after meeting up with Bastila's asshole of a mother and learning about her father's death, we head out to find his holocron and return it to her. Well, here comes Big Bad Bandon, ready to die in the same location that Kalo Nord died at. I gotta admit, seeing another set of space bikes parked here forever is kinda funny. If Malik sends another goon after me, I'm coming back to this cave on principle. So yeah, we sort of work out the issues between Bastila and her mother, and now I kinda care about her. Fuck. God damn it, Bioware. I think we should have some privacy for this. Come with me. 
So Manan is a big old water planet. It's like entirely ocean besides some man-made structures which litter parts of it. We arrive on Big Shell and I'm not harassed for docking fees by Zerka for once, which is nice. When I arrive inside, I get to watch a Republic officer and a Sith officer tell each other that their dad could beat up the other one's dad. I think that's one of the most interesting parts about this universe, because there are obviously Republic-dictated planets and Sith ones. But Manan in particular is a neutral planet which forbid the two from fighting each other. So the two forces kind of both go about their respective businesses while having to be around each other. The reason that either side hasn't dominated the planet yet is because of this super potent healing agent called Kulto. The fish people of Manan built this big above water hub so that they could sell to both sides and threaten to destroy the only known source of it in the galaxy if either side attacks them. It's pretty smart though this Republic officer guesses that the Sith are probably going to try to do something to take the planet anyways. It definitely makes for an interesting setting to say the least, especially with the whole planet being a water one. I just hope that this doesn't evolve into some kind of water exploration slash combat. Nobody likes water levels, they just like the idea of them. Oh, if you don't know where that is, go north from here, then south past the port official in the first courtyard, east into the second courtyard, then north, then east again. You got that? Have a pleasant stay, Master Jedi. So Manan is definitely the prettiest planet so far. Maybe period, given that Korriban is a Sith world filled with volcanic activity. It's got this giant glass front part facing out towards an endless ocean and it looks really cool, even today. The issue is that this place has kind of been filled with vast amounts of nothing so far. I mean, a desert on Tatooine? Sure, makes sense for it to not have much. But even then, there was quite a bit to interact with. Here on Manan, I've ran into, um, a Pazak player, a Pazak card seller, and a dude who basically rehashes the whole idea of this planet hosting both Sith and Republic forces. Oh, and more groups of Sith and Republic officers basically saying that their side is gonna win. Nice. There's a point where a Sith officer tries to shake you down for 20 credits saying that this area was for Sith only. When you say, nah, I'm not gonna do that, she's like, typical Republic scum not giving us money and shit. Then that's all that happens. Selkath, Traveler, Selkath, Sith Officer, Republic Officer, Selkath, Cleaning Droid, ooh, Sith Negotiator. I have no desire to speak to you. Shit. Oh, dude, swoop races. Holy shit, now there's an exciting new mechanic. Eventually, I do manage to make it to the Republic Embassy, which has a mission for me in exchange for data on the star map. One of their, um, scanner module droid things that were in the ocean came floating all the way up and it was all disabled and shit. The Sith got the Selkath to delay the Republic's retrieval of this thing long enough for the Sith to recover it instead. And now the Republic wants me to retrieve it. So I have a few ways to proceed, but interrogating a Sith prisoner is the easiest one. This more or less has me mashing through options until I succeed, which is a little silly because they set up the situation with a very serious tone. Like, oh, you can use the truth serum, but if he resists enough, his mind will blank. Then you'll have to use the neutralizer before using the serum again. But if you use it too much, he might forget everything that he knows. I think I failed this task like 12 to 15 times, and he never forgot anything. Oh well, I got my info and I make it to the Sith base, fight some dudes, and miraculously manage to find the correct area to go to the very first time. Then I grab the data and zip out back to the Republic. At least, that was the plan. Since the Selkath have a very strict policy against violence, and they heard of a fight breaking out, they place me under arrest as I walk out. I'm assigned a lawyer who tries to defend me by saying that I was there by coincidence. That goes poorly. So I dismiss him and defend myself, stating that the Sith lured me to their base to try to coerce me to the dark side, and then attacked me when I refused. They don't have enough evidence to convict me and basically side with me and put the Sith on a lockdown of sorts, barring them from the protection of their laws for the time being. While that does seem like a huge victory, I can't help but think that this is all the reason the Sith will need to try to initiate some sort of hostile takeover. Still, this whole planet was relatively mundane in terms of questing until this Chrono Trigger-esque arrest, so I'm pretty happy about its conclusion. Not only that, but this quest seems to kick off this planet's string of quests, finally. When I walk out, a woman approaches Jolie in my party and lets him know that her husband, an old friend of Jolie's, is locked up and being framed by the Sith for murder. I go back to the judges and submit my request to be this guy's lawyer. Now I have to quiz different witnesses, the judges themselves, and the defendant. The judges seem split on how they feel about the Republic and the Sith, 
and they're also split about how they feel about the capability of this old man who supposedly killed a Sith officer in her prime. The defendant, Sunri, tells me that he was meeting the woman at the hotel because he's pretending to be a Sith spy, feeding the Sith false information. At the same time, the woman seemed to be pretty close to turning into a double agent and working for the Republic as well. Sunri thinks that the woman was murdered by the Sith when they found out, and then they planted a medal which belonged to him in her hand. So I'm off to the hotel to canvass the witnesses here. I start with the hotel owner who thinks that the gunshot went off and then Sunri ran off afterwards. Well, I decide to ask him if he would testify the opposite way. No. 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 That's a lot of money. Gathering testimonies from the other two witnesses shows that a Sith personnel paid off one of them to plant the metal on the victim's body, but also that the victim and the defendant were definitely having an affair, and that the victim may have been a dark Jedi, not just an ordinary Sith. This makes the likelihood of her being shot and killed by an old man way less likely. Soon after leaving the hotel, I'm told by a stranger that both the Republic and the Sith have played a role in this case and that each side is trying to win against the other. In addition to this court case, I run into someone who wants me to figure out why the Republic is suddenly hiring so many mercenaries, and someone who suspects the Sith of kidnapping many young Selkath children, including his own daughter. A mercenary from a bloodthirsty race of people tells me that the Sith hired him to collect as many children as he could from the Selkath and bring them to their embassy. As far as the Republic mass hiring their mercenaries goes, I'm pointed towards their embassy for answers also. So basically, all of these side quests involve snooping around both sides' embassies. So here are all of these side quests back to back. The Republic is hiring mercenaries because basically they struck a deal with some of the more Republic-minded Selkath to build a harvesting base directly on top of the source of the Kulto healing agent. When they were nearing completion, they found the star map, and soon after, communications went completely dark. They sent down some Republic officers and got no communication back. Then they started sending down mercenaries over and over to try to get to the bottom of what happened. As far as the Sith kidnapping Selkath children goes, yes, they have been kidnapping them. Though it's more of a coercion than a kidnapping. Basically, they've been training potential future leaders of the Selkath in the ways of the Sith, brainwashing them so that they could eventually take over the planet and control the Kulto mining. I find the evidence of this and convince the children to report the crimes of the Sith to the Selkath leadership. And then finally, the trial. So Sunri did kill the Sith woman. It was caught on videotape by Sith recording devices, then seized by the Republic when Sunri called in a favor. After this, the Sith tried to plant the evidence to help them win the upcoming court case by paying off this goofy bastard. The reason Sunri did it was because, yes, he was having an affair, but he wasn't converting the Dark Jedi to come over to the Republic's side, he was being used by her for his information, pretending like she was going to be joining his side at some point. When he found out that she was using him, he went mad with rage and waited for her to fall asleep before shooting her. I actually have no idea how to proceed with this case. I already paid the guy at the front desk to turn a blind eye to the fact that Sunri ran away after the gunshot. But realistically, the guy killed someone because he was angry with them. But then again, she was a dark Jedi. This is really a morally ambiguous case, holy shit. And there's no right answer. You're making a decision on what to do with this man's life, and no matter how you slice it, the decision doesn't feel 100% right. I think the tipping point for me was the fact that Sunri started to fall back on the whole, this will ruin the Republic because the Selkath will ban them from harvesting Kalto after this. I just hate how this guy's now taking the high road and using it as a shield for his actions, stating that he killed a Sith and there's nothing wrong with that. So I send him down the river with the video evidence though I couldn't help but reload a save and see how the whole trial plays out because it really tickles my Phoenix Wright itch. It is an honor to see justice served, and I will see Sunri is executed for the crime he has committed. Sunri left before I heard the blaster shot. Impossible! She carried a lightsaber under that cloak of hers. Objection! That doesn't prove she was a Jedi. In the Republic, it is awarded only to the bravest, most valorous, most honorable men. Lies! Slander! I object! Were you in Alassa's room on the night of the murder? I was working on her, trying to turn her over to the Republic side. An obviously false story. I did not kill her! Your honors! No! God damn, that was a fun quest. So now it's down to the bottom of the ocean or something like that, both to figure out what went awry and for the star map. Well, I guess the Selkath went insane when some kind of voice went off and affected the minds of everyone in the facility. 
Everyone else was fine after a moment, but the Selkath entered some kind of frenzy state and started attacking everyone in sight. The thing about this section is that it could have been so much… scarier. Like the way that the few survivors talk to you makes it sound like these fishmen went completely bloodthirsty, attacking and eating every single person that they could. But the reality is that fighting them feels about the same as fighting any other creature in this game. I don't know. I feel like a remaster of this area could be incredible. Anyways, I pop on an environment suit and go… <sighs> to the bottom of the ocean. No attacks. No force powers. And about 20% of my normal movement speed. Water levels, man. Come on, hurry up. Don't just stand there, we have to keep moving. The water is filled with- <sighs> Are you fucking kidding me? So here's something I found out after several times of dying to these idiots. You need a sonic emitter to carry onward and kill these things. I did not grab that. So I reload a save and grab two of them, and then get back to it. Fortunately, my force speed glitched out and let me move at 40% of my normal speed, so that was cool. After killing off Firaxis games and finally ending the Tropico series once and for all, I make it to probably the worst voice acting in the game. I mean, to be honest, a lot of voice acting was a lot better than I thought it would be for 2003. But holy shit, man. No, no. The Firaxa will get us. No, the Selkath are coming. No! 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 Ah! Ah! No! You! Sammy! Sammy, calm down! I don't think they're here to kill us! Uh, Kono! Kono! Are, are they? Yes. I think they're here to help us. Eventually, they stopped panicking enough to tell me that a big fat fucking shark rose up and gave them all the mind melt. They theorized that it's been around for a long ass time and it's been eating Kulto to sustain itself, thus making it big. So my options here are to use this machine constructed down here to vent a very potent poison into the area and kill off the sharks, or to do a math puzzle to overload the machine and cause it to self-destruct, saving the shark. I go with the latter because it seems good to save this thing that's only doing what it does best, being a big goddamn shark with psychic powers. Awesome. I haven't talked a lot about the logic puzzles in this game, but there are quite a few of them that involve me thinking my way through various math problems, drawing me to the conclusion that someone at Bioware was a big nerd. I hated math when I was growing up, but I actually like these simple logic puzzles a lot. They make me feel smart until I fail them. So the facility explodes and the shark gives me a nod to go ahead and map my star. I suck down the info and tiptoe back to the surface. Then I get arrested again. Yep, one last case to go out on. Except this time they're like, why'd you explode stuff? And I'm like, big goddamn shark, man. And they go, holy shit, dude, all right, you're free to go. Apparently it was like the creator of their people or something according to their legends. And they're stoked to know that God's still alive down there, swimming the good swim. Let's get off this planet. This time the Sith don't send another mercenary or Sith master after us. Instead, the man who's been interacting with Malik comes for us himself. It turns out that this guy was Karth's old commander the person who taught him everything he knows about being a soldier. It's the reason that Karth is extremely slow to trust you. Well, this gigantic ship has no issue plucking us away from our destination and pulling us into it. Here's the prison sequence that a lot of games around this time seem to have. The issue with this particular prison sequence is the fact that, well, we're all kind of badasses. It isn't one Jedi and a bunch of crewmates, it's four Jedi, a Wookiee two incredibly well-trained soldiers who have seen many battles, two droids, and a, um, roguish Twi'lek girl. Ironically, I rely on the last one to free us here from prison. But the fact remains that as long as Malik himself isn't waiting for us when we dock, we really should have no issues fighting our way out. But it's just your standard capture sequence. You get stripped down, thrown into capture cells, and tortured for information. I will leave you here in your cell with a small taste of the horrors you will suffer when Lord Malak arrives. Ah! I don't know. It just kind of negates the entire idea that you're an ultra-powerful group when an old man in a hat captures your crew with no issue. What we do learn from this situation is that Dantooine was destroyed by the Sith, along with the Jedi Enclave there. Malik is on his way and ready to interrogate you himself. And... oh yeah. Oh, this can't be true, can it? You really don't know what's going on here, do you? Hmm. What could I possibly not know about that seems plot-twisty? 
Anyways, I pilot mission here to get us all freed and then bounce on out of here. So I have to go to the bridge to open the hangar bay doors so that we can leave. When we get there, a big old battle between us and Karth's old commander ensues, and Karth moves in to finish the job after. I know that Jedi are like this really good force in the universe. I mean, I get that. I'll just never get the whole, no, don't do it, you'll become like them. I mean, we just kind of mortally wounded him, why not let Karth finish the job to avenge his wife? I don't know. I guess I just don't buy into that Jedi tenant. The commander's final words to Karth make him wig out and confront Bastila about some big secret. Realistically, it would make a lot more sense if both she and the Jedi Council knew that I was Revan. I mean, how wouldn't they? So here's a fun little sequence. I forget to open the hangar doors because this was a time before big glowing objective markers and a bunch of Sith came charging in to block our escape. So I fuck on off out of there, have to moonbase Alpha through the same sequence as before, which unequips all of our weapons for whatever reason. I get all the way to the elevator and it's like, ah, oh, you forgot to do the bridge thing. Brilliant. I reload an old save, fight Old Man River again, remember to open the hangar doors and leave again. The fortunate part is that they don't make me spacewalk again since I opened the hangar doors, which is nice of them. Uh-oh, here comes Malik, and boy is he good at laughing. <laughs> so yeah, I'm Revan. They spared me and wiped my memories because only I can stop me. The reality of the situation is that Malik turned on me because he wanted my power. The Jedi Council sent a task force of knights against me and Malik took action at that very moment. Instead of letting me die, they took me away to reprogram my mind and help them find the Starforge. Bastila flip-flops between the truth and the whole idea that I could be saved, and that even as an evil Sith Lord I deserved to be saved. The Jedi Council was desperate, and they saw an opportunity. I don't blame them, but this lip service of all life deserves to be spared is blatant bullshit. I don't know, Jedi's man. They annoy me. Actually, let me ask one of you nerds out there this. Why did the Council send a strike team of knights to go kill the Dark Lord Revan? They do still have masters even in this dire time. What is it that holds them back from fighting or infiltrating or doing a lot of this really dangerous stuff themselves? Is it just their presence would be detected because they're stronger in the way of the Force, or... I don't, I don't know. I mean, when I asked this before, I didn't realize I was Revan yet. It made a little more sense for them to send Bastila and I to the first star map location on Dantooine given that knowledge. But still, it always feels like achieving the role of Master is basically just retirement. Maybe that is what it is. I feel like I've seen Masters fight. Alright, enough about that. So you're now to fight Malik alone, which is a huge, huge mistake. Not because he's super powerful or anything like that, but because he's extraordinarily weak. The battle goes like this. I hit him twice, he hides behind a blast door, I chase him around and fight him again down to like, I don't know, an eighth of his health. I am doing the opposite of struggling here. Then you know what happens? He does this stupid god mode freeze attack thing and then Bastila whips her lightsaber at Malik and tells me to run. What? No, I can, I can just kill him. Then the door locks on them, and I have no other choice but to run. This is so stupid. The player should not have been made to fight Malik at this stage. I would have been happier if he had just simply kidnapped her and escaped. Okay, say you wrote the game to go down this way. Here's what you do. You make Malik nearly invincible, and you buff the hell out of him. You make the fight scripted to lose, and when you get low enough, he freezes you and goes in to finish you off before Bastila makes her big sacrifice. The way that this happened was the worst way it could have happened, and it makes the whole escape sequence the stupidest shit ever. Even more so when you have to blast more ships out of the sky. What a poor decision. <sighs> Anyways, Karth tries to do the whole, how can I trust you thing again for like the 9,000th time, and literally everyone else is like, well, we trust him, so... I do like that HK-47 regains his memories and remembers that he happens to be Revan's droid. What's even funnier is the fact that the game points out to you how convenient it is that you happen to find him in some random shop on Tatooine. And then Candorus goes, Yeah, but have you heard about the plot hole filling device known as the Force which literally explains away any sort of convenience in story writing as space magic? Okay, enough of the logistics, let's talk about Korriban. When I pictured the planet, I expected landing in some volcanic region surrounded by enemies. 
Instead, I land in the middle of more Zerka people. They're like, welcome to Planet Evil. Good to see that you brought the evil ship back and intend to become an evil Jedi. Oh. Alright, yeah, that's, that's what I'm here for. There isn't a lot to this place at first glance. A cantina with no music, a Zerka place, and then outside is the Sith Academy for training Sith. That's my target, so I have to pretend that I want to defect from the Jedi Order, and I'm here to join them. I try to persuade them to let me in in a few different ways, but apparently the 14 or so persuasion I have just isn't enough. I know there's a force persuade, but I'm really wondering if sinking so many of my points into persuade as a soldier slash guardian who doesn't gain many points per level was worth it. Because I really fail checks more often than I succeed at them. Either way, I beat the shit out of some Sith and take their medallion to gain admittance into the Sith Academy. It's here that they're like, we're all evil, but only the most evil will become a Sith. I don't even know if I need to become Korriban's next top Sith to gain access to the star map, honestly, but I'm guessing I probably do. Well, all of my questions are answered as the lady who originally went, nah, I don't trust you because something's weird with you, now goes, I trust you implicitly. Please help me kill my master. All right then. She tells me that I have to become the next big Sith boy to get into the tomb where the star map is, and then tells me exactly how to do so. So I clear out three tombs, kill two of the other students, and turn one back towards the light side, potentially. The artifacts gained here are actually pretty damn powerful, but also very much have a dark side requirement. The puzzles and trials are easy as hell, but they are enjoyable to a degree, which is what matters more. So I head back with all this stuff and the Sith Master is like, I'm very impressed. I'm not impressed enough yet though. He does that over and over again until finally he is impressed enough. I then head to the final trial which involves me fighting a few regular beasts, two super tough ones, and doing this logic puzzle that's easy but tedious. Technically I didn't need to do that last bit but I didn't realize that until later. After this I freeze this acid river that I likely could have force jumped over and grab the final star map. My final action in this whole academy is supposed to be me striking down the master's pupil since he realized that she was trying to strike him down. I choose to side with the lady who turns on me afterwards because she's a Sith. And all Sith fight Sith when they're threatened. I get a chance to spare her and I do because I'm Space Jesus. The thing about Korriban is that, well, it's a neat concept to a degree, but from a storytelling perspective, it almost feels like it's better suited to do earlier in the game. I know you can do it earlier, but there's a point where it's like I've been on all of these other planets and I've interacted with Sith across the galaxy to a point where I was on one of their main ships and yet no one recognizes me as this Jedi troublemaker who's definitely wanted by the Sith. Oh well. After wrapping up a few side quests and gaining access to my official 7-Eleven pre-order Slurpee lightsabers, it's time to press onwards to my final endeavor in this game. As we warp into the part of the system where the Starforge is, Karth sends out a signal alerting the rest of the Republic fleet to head over and help out. This leads into yet another ship shooting sequence, but this time with a different background. Then our stabilizers go out and it causes us to plummet to the only planet nearby. It's determined that the Sith have some kind of jammer which forces ships to crash into this planet via disabling their engines. This raises a question about a huge oversight with the Sith's plan. Why wouldn't they just lure the Republic's ships over here to the Starforge and let their jammer crash their entire fleet into this planet? Because the way that Karth tells it, we have to disable whatever's causing this phenomenon before the Republic fleet gets there or the whole thing's just gonna crash and burn. It just seems like such a wasted advantage to me. In the meantime, Malak is converting Bastila to the dark side the only way that he knows how, by electrocuting her until she has mild to severe Alzheimer's. Can't wait to see how Darth Bastila looks. So our objective is to disable the field, get our ship working, and try again. This has me running into these natives which are technologically very primitive. They have no idea what a computer is and refer to the force as magic. They also claim that Revan came here and made a deal with them to slay their enemies if they gave up knowledge on how to bypass the barrier into the main temple here. Evidently Revan had no intention of fulfilling his end of the agreement, and seems to have gotten the information he needed from their enemies instead. These enemies are fewer in number, more technologically advanced, and a lot smarter than these guys here. At least going off the information they've given me. Also, I have a small starship on my face now. Well, turns out that their enemies are simply more Rakata who have barred themselves off from the rest of their barbaric race. The way that they tell it, they were the so-called builders of the Starforge, and had a tremendous wealth of technological wisdom and control over the Force. 
They enslaved other races, conquering most of the galaxy under the banner of the Infinite Empire before eventually becoming numb to the Force. When they found that their race had evolved to not being able to use the Force anymore, they had to revert back to more primitive technology before eventually cannibalizing and destroying themselves with weapons of mass destruction. The priests who survived the assault in their temple came together and formed a new enclave to try and rebuild while straying from destructive technology. They're utterly ashamed of the Starforge and its capabilities, and wanted Revan to destroy it. When they realized he used it for his own nefarious purposes, they assumed that they would never see Revan again. Well, surprise, here I am. And I tell them that I basically want to destroy the Starforge and need access to it. Which is literally the exact same thing that I told them that I wanted to do when I was all evil and shit. They don't believe me, of course, and want me to prove that I've changed by rescuing one of their scouts from the barbaric tribe on the other side of the island. What I don't understand is that I can't, like, activate the Starforge again, right? It's already activated. What harm is there in letting me go there again? Maybe I can crank this fucker to 11 if I got back in. Alright, so I can't, like, manipulate or talk my way into getting the prisoner out like I thought I could, because these guys immediately go, Ah, we saw that you went into that place that we can't possibly get into and then come back out. We have no way of knowing if you killed the elders in there or not, but we think that you haven't. The video game logic is getting worse and worse, man. So yeah, I fight my way through all of this shit, free the prisoner, and then hoof it back. They tell me that I can enter the temple now with their help, but that there are leftover Sith forces from before in it. So Jumanji and Jolie tag along to help me out, and we bust on through this temple. Well, here comes a large-scale surprise, it's Bastila, and she's evil. Dang. Here's some cliff notes. Hey guys, it's me, your good pal Bastila. I've been fried worse than a weekend at Burning Man, so now I'm evil and I must end your life. I am much more powerful than you, for sure. Okay, alright, so I'm not that powerful, but you! Man, you sure are powerful. Why don't you come be powerful with me? We can kill Malak, and I could be your apprentice. Shit will be so good. The Jedi Order is really manipulative, you know? So let's just go be bad guys instead. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not feeling the whole, join me on the dark side thing. Like, I could get a little more into it if my dialogue choices weren't, No! You have betrayed us! Please come back to the light! Or, Haha, fuck yeah, dude, let's go kill Malak and rule the galaxy. I just want, like, a solid, logical, in-between set of dialogue. I want a neutral set. Because really, I get the whole idea of the Jedi Order being super manipulative with how they present their tenants. They really get on people for being anything other than emotionless drones, and I'm not a huge fan. But at the same time, the relentless destructiveness of the dark side has historically repeated itself a few times in this game alone with the downfall of the Sith under Exar Kun, and then even further back with the entire plight of the Rakata race cannibalizing itself. But I'm left with these extreme dialogue options which tilt one way or the other. And the whole thing winds up with Bastila becoming another generic Sith apprentice who has about as much personality as any other one. I guess I just don't care about her as much after speaking to a much more interestingly written character like Jolie in my downtime. I throw the switches and disable the fields and all that jazz. Oh yeah, and Bastila just ran away and rejoined Malik. I assume to add a solid three seconds to his boss encounter later. So we make our way to the gigantic battle between the Sith and the Republic. Of course, Bastila's battle meditation is making it impossible for the Republic to break through, so only a very small force could infiltrate the Star Forge at this point. That would be us and a few other random Jedi fleets. Malik's whole plan is to basically stall us for time with wave after wave of droids, Sith troopers, and Dark Jedi. When we eventually push through all of that, he offers up Bastila as the final stall for time. Here's how the battle goes. This time, you will not defeat me. I see now why Malak followed you. It is you who are doomed. Your strength falters. The light side is failing you while the power of the star... This is not possible. You have rejected the dark side. You are a weak and pathetic servant of the light. I could join you in your battle against the Dark Lord, but how would you be able to trust me? Are you certain you wish to take this risk? I could end your life and gain Malak's favor with a single stroke of my lightsaber. The dark side has wholly consumed me, and you will suffer for failing to see that. I just... I don't know. Bastila's cockiness really irritated me at first, and then I started to grow fond of her. 
But as time went on, the relationship your character forms with her is very shallow. It seems so deep because you have this bond that was formed through her saving you and she wants to keep you from the dark side and blah blah blah, but it all seems very guided and purposefully tragic. It irritates me even more when we had all of these dark side talks to keep me from going back to it at the beginning of the game. They make more sense now, but the existence of these talks only further exacerbates her arrogant hypocrisy when she falls to the dark side after all of that lecture. I just got sick of her. To me, Bastila has an overpowered plot-bending talent and an underpowered personality. Though for as let down as I was, I do have to admit that the cutscene that follows when her battle meditation fails is actually pretty damn cool, even if the graphics are obviously dated. I just wish Bastila would have followed me to fight Malik and then maybe betrayed me afterwards or something. Though I do have to wonder what a dark side playthrough would look like at this stage. In the next room, I encounter Malik, who has two Republic soldiers with him who he is currently choking the life out of. I don't know how they made it this far either, but apparently their sole purpose is to die in front of you. Malik then cackles his evil laugh and goes, Hey, check out how cool the Starforge is. And then he seals me in this room. This is by far the worst designed boss fight I have ever played in my entire life. I've relied on Mission to use all of the computers in the game except for in the temple on the Rakatan planet when I used John Bon Jovi. So needless to say, my computer use is zilch. Well, I don't have any party members anymore, they got frozen into another dimension by Count Bastila. So my goal here is to use eight spikes on all six computers to get the machines to stop spawning. Except I have almost no spikes. So I have to kill about 45 or so droids to gain these spikes. I walked away from my PC to use the bathroom at one point during this fight. Unfortunately, I don't keep attacking things that aren't right next to me, so that didn't help. This fight is just the worst. When it's too easy, it's a giant waste of time. If it were much harder, I would imagine this would be more of an unsatisfying nightmare slog of healing and injecting and saving new files. It's just a horribly designed fight from head to toe. Well, the room after this is... well, it's not a lot better. I can almost hear the devs going, well, if you like that, then you're gonna love this. Basically, Malik is a lot more powerful than before, which is good. But without a gimmick to keep him alive for more than 10 seconds, the fight would be over in, uh, well, 10 seconds. So he unveils, or rather points out, that there are chambers of Jedi which are in some kind of stasis tubes. Malik then claims that each of these Jedi are basically dead, but the Starforge has kept their souls from passing on to the Force. I don't know how many there are, I stopped counting after a while, but sweet fuck, there's a lot. You basically fight Malik from full health over and over and over again for every single Jedi tube that there is in this room. It's rough, but honestly, it's a little more enjoyable than the droid room since I actually did struggle a bit. When all is said and done, Malik laments ever joining the dark side and wonders if his future would have been different if our roles had been reversed. I look down on him with my tiny spaceship face before leaving out to where Karth is, who tells me that we need to get the hell out of Dodge before the Republic fleet gives this place the old Alderaan treatment. You make your grand escape and get escorted back, uh, to the Rakatan planet. I guess they didn't want to design a new backdrop for this celebration. It's all very Star Wars-y and you can guess how it goes just by looking at what's on screen. Knights of the Old Republic is... It's hard to judge exactly because while I did have a lot of fun, it's got so many flaws which could have been stamped out were the game redone in some way. The game is good, but it's in desperate need of some upkeep. A remaster, a patch, something that might never happen. Because even with all of the fixes I applied, the game has an 80% chance of not launching in 1920 by 1080 which isn't even a resolution in the game by default. The other option is playing in some variant of 800 by 600 and I'd rather play with my monitor turned off instead. My saves corrupted a few times, causing me to have to redo entire areas. My UI wonks out sometimes, causing the 800 by 600 version to display, in addition to stripping the models of their texture layers. The AI pathing can be absolutely atrocious, as evidenced by members of my party getting stuck on objects and outside of the map sometimes. Oftentimes you receive a set of dialogue options, and it doesn't feel like you picking a specific one gives you a specific answer back. Many times the options are, I'm a good guy, the force is good, here's the neutral response, and I'm a huge asshole Sith man, watch out. Much of the dialogue in general tends to repeat itself quite a lot by the end of the game, especially the whole light side versus dark side argument. The combat is old and stale and clunky beyond belief, and it feels ridiculous when you're trying to buff yourself mid-battle only for said buffs to last a solid 20 seconds and you taking a third of your health and damage while you apply them. 
Gimmicks like swoop races and starship battles are repetitive beyond belief and desperately need some kind of advancement to keep them interesting for as often as they're presented. But the game isn't bad either, not at all. It's chock full of content and interesting lore. There are tons and tons and tons of things that I didn't even mention. Specific nifty puzzles, dialogue with all different party members and the stories they have to tell, side quests that give you fun ideas to digest. Some of my favorite dialogue in the game stems from quizzing Jolie on his pass and asking what he thinks about the Jedi Order, and him going on about everyone thinking that the Order is infallible and can do no wrong. If I mentioned every little interesting conversation, this video would easily have been twice as long. I did it all for the Wookiees. The Wookiees. It's really what makes this game shine at all, because without the intrigue garnered from the various random characters, races, and environments, this would easily be one of those games that fell by the wayside and completely forgotten about. There's a reason why Knights of the Old Republic is so highly regarded in people's hearts and memories. And even after I was happy to be done with the game, part of me started to wonder how a dark side playthrough would turn out. While I do think that a fair amount of nostalgia is necessary to fully appreciate the game and overlook some of its glaring issues, it's still a fine game for someone new to pick up if they know what they're getting into. I would absolutely love to see a remaster of both the first and second games. I know it's somewhat unlikely, but we've been in an age of remakes for quite a bit now and anything is possible. Thanks for watching. I should have realized that this was a Bioware game going in, but holy shit that took a while. I know that a few of you are going to want to see a Knights of the Old Republic 2 at some point, and I have no qualms about firing it up sometime, but not for a bit. I'm kind of uh, Star wars out at the moment. So until then I have, well I've got shirts now. If you want to support me and wear a shirt with a thing on it, I've got shirts with things on them from Crowdmade. You want a shirt? One with a thing on it? I got it. So check that out if um, you want a shirt with a thing on it. Anyways, I have a Twitch where I stream once on a blue moon. I have a Twitter where I tweet out my newest videos. I have a Discord where people chill out and shoot the shit in the meantime. And I have a Patreon. And that's it. Have a good one.